You're listening to Campaign 2012, a podcast from the Brookings Institution. In your paper, you suggest four areas, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, of reforms that are not simply um, government reorganization and mm -hmm. shuffling around mm -hmm. the flowcharts. Mm -hmm. um, let's, let's tick through them a little bit and talk about what a um, Galston-inflected, reform-minded presidency mm -hmm. would, mm -hmm. would be trying to get done mm -hmm. um, institutionally. So you start with uh, uh, some reforms related to fiscal institutions, yes. which you've already alluded to a little bit. But, mm -hmm. but so what does it look like in, in a first term if a president comes in or the, the ad current administration is reelected and decided, okay, the super committee really failed, let's, let's do fiscal reform from, the in, from an institutional point of view mm -hmm. rather than simply from a policy point of view. What, what, what does it look like? Well, you go back to the 1974 Act. You put it on the table. You say, some pieces of this have really worked well, like the Congressional Budget Office, for example. We're, we're going we're gonna to keep that, and we, matter of fact, we may even reinforce it and add to its powers. But some pieces of it are now clearly obsolete. Uh, the relationship between the budget committees and the committees that are responsible for taxes and entitlements, that is not a productive relationship. We need, we need to change that. The entire process where we start with a budget resolution and the appropriations bills wait on that resolution and sometimes wait forever on that resolution so that only, only four times in the past four decades have we actually gotten the appropriations bills done on time. That's clearly a broken system too. The assumption was, if you go back to the 74 Act, that the overall budget framework, the so-called budget resolution, which is an agreement between the House and the Senate, not including the President, would be done by April 15th. Well, they barely cleared their throats to begin talking about it in Congress by April 15th for the most part. So those are examples of things that experience has taught us don't work. Some of them didn't work from the very beginning, and others have worked less and less well over the past four decades. So you change that, mm -hmm. and details to come there are a lot of proposals on the table. I'm about to come out with a big, per, big paper summarizing the wisdom of a number of graybeards on, on such questions. But uh, there are a lot of ways to go. But if you want to, if you want to improve both the substance and the timeliness of our fiscal decisions, then the status quo is simply not an option. So you also propose uh, both the consolidation of agencies and government functions that are duplicative and the deconsolidation of things that have been consolidated in ways that don't work. Um, just I walk us briefly through why each of those is important and give us an example of them. Well, uh, first of all, if there's, an inf if there's an important function of government, in order to discharge it effectively and accountability, you need a and accountably, you need a single locus of responsibility. There's a lot of experience that points in that direction. I'll take a very important function, ensuring the safety of our food supply. For a century, that single function has been distributed across a number of agencies, some of which are cross-pressured. The Department of Agriculture has responsibility for food safety, for example, but it's also responsible for food process to food processors and food producers who may not always be very enthusiastic about safety procedures that they see as imposing additional costs on them. Uh, in my judgment, we need to bring together all of the scattered food safety functions of the federal government into a single food safety agency whose sole mission it is to advocate for and push for uh, the safety and security of the U.S. food supply. Now I'll give you an example of the reverse. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security was a genuine institutional response to the events of 9-11 and it's had a number of positive consequences. But in some respects, the consolidation went too far. For example, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, 
which used to have direct access to the president, is now layered in a very complex bureaucracy. And we saw the consequences in Hurricane Katrina and the ineptitude of the federal government's response to that, which had something to do with snarled lines of communication. And FEMA was notably ineffective in figuring out how to discharge its responsibilities under law. Just a few years earlier, it had been one of the genu genuine institutional success stories of the Clinton administration. FEMA was not highly regarded when Bill Clinton took office, but it was regarded as an A-plus agency by the time he left. Uh, and it was a lot easier to achieve that change with an independent entity than in something that is layered three or four tiers down in the bureaucracy of, the, of Homeland Security, which is where it is now. So I am strongly in favor, and I'm not alone in this, in advocating the deconsolidation of FEMA. It has a distinctive domestic disaster responsibility unrelated to terrorism, uh, unrelated to Homeland Security defined in military terms, and it ought to be free to carry out that mission and to report directly to the President when necessary. Finally, there's a last category of reforms that you talk about that are aimed specifically at um, depolarizing the political culture. I'm wondering if you can give, first of all, a, a, a general justification for why a president who is himself a partisan, whether that's whatever president we have is the product of a party system, would, would, would want to push in that direction toward, toward, you know, toward a less party polarized um, culture. And secondly, talk a little bit about some of the specific steps that you urge in that direction. Well, two things. First of all, uh, partisan polarization today is at the highest level it has reached in more than 100 years. Not since the 1890s have we seen this sort of unity within each party or such a division between the parties. And we have seen in recent years what the consequences are for public policy. And President Obama himself has felt the consequences. He campaigned and actually came to prominence in first in 2004 as someone who said we're not red America and blue America, one, we're one United States of America and I will be a president who brings us back together. Well, the president has fulfilled wholly or in part many of his campaign pledges. That's one where arguably things have gone in the other direction and the polarization is even worse than when he was campaigning. Uh, and, <coughs> and that has had important consequences for him, his ability to get the nation's business done. I don't think he wanted his major initiatives to stand or fall on straight party line votes, but that's what happened. And that's not good for the country, setting aside the question of whether it's good for a president who is party leader as well as uh, as well as head of the head of the executive branch i'll give you a very concrete example the president has been intensely frustrated by the way so many of his nominations have stalled in the senate you know uh, very highly qualified nominees by everybody's estimation get caught in the partisan crossfire well it didn't surprise me when the president in his 2012 State of the Union address embraced one of the, the polar, polarization reducing gridlock breaking proposals that a civic group that I've been working with has been advocating. Here's the idea very simply. Once the Senate receives a completed nomination from the president. By completed, I mean all the background checks done, all the required federal forms completed. The Senate, the clock begins ticking, and the Senate will then have 90 days to give an up or down vote to said nominee. And here's the kicker. If they don't do that on day 91, the nominee will be deemed as a matter of law uh, uh, to be confirmed. And. Uh, I think that re regardless of who the next president is, the next president should be in favor of that. And 
One reason that it's worth talking about these in the context of a presidential campaign is that institutional reform is something that affects the powers and capacities of the respective branches of government, starting with the presidency. And so, and so former Governor Romney, former Senator Santorum, former Speaker Gingrich, and not former anything, <laughs> Representative Ron Paul, should all be interested in the question of the president's ability to execute the powers of his office effectively. And there are lots of other examples in the same vein that suggest that any president ought to be interested in proposals of that sort. Thank you very much. My pleasure. For more information about the paper discussed here or the Campaign 2012 project, please visit our website at www.brookings.edu campaign2012.